Welcome and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's NECMAP knowledge sharing webinar. Uh, my name is Victoria uh, and I'm a consultant at UNESCO Bangkok. I will be your host for today's program. So we gathered here this afternoon to learn about the state of AI in differentiated learning and assessment in Asia Pacific and beyond. Uh, but before we start the program, uh, I would like to remind um, everyone to please mute your microphones uh, during the presentations. And um, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. So we will have the time for questions during the Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. So now without further ado, let me invite Margaret Zaxas Ryle the Chief of Section 4 Inclusive Quality Education at UNESCO Bangkok for the welcoming remarks. Margaret, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Good afternoon uh, to everyone from Bangkok. Um, I'm truly delighted to welcome you to our webinar, The State of AI in Differentiated Learning and Assessment in Asia Pacific and Beyond. This webinar is the seventh in a series of knowledge sharing webinars produced by the Network on Education Quality Monitoring in the Asia Pacific, short known as NECMAP. As we have seen in recent years, the COVID-19 crisis has further exacerbated the pre-existing learning crisis with students across the globe facing unprecedented challenges in access, engagement, learning outcomes and well-being. The crisis also revealed the limitations of the traditional classroom, in particular in meeting the diverse needs of students. For example, in many countries, teachers find themselves restricted by an overwhelming number of students they must instruct, as, it, as well as by routine tasks that consume a lot of their valuable preparation time. As a result, um, uh, teachers uh, have a hard time pattering with the uh, learning needs and they have limited time in taking a learner-centered approach and customizing learning experiences to the needs of every student. Given these challenges, artificial intelligence has emerged as a possible solution. AI can expand teachers' capacity by alleviating routine administrative tasks, meaningfully catering to each student through individualized materials and providing each student with timely, substantive feedback. Moreover, with the recent popularity of programs such as ChatGPT, these possibilities seem even more realistic today. At the same time, while AI represents new opportunities, there are also concerns such as students' privacy, academic integrity, and ensuring equity in learning. In this view, UNESCO has released a guidance for generative AI in education and research, as well as an AI competency framework. These will be presented to you today during today's webinars. We also will have the pleasure to hear from a number of experts from the region who will examine a range of pertinent topics related to AI and learning, followed by a Q&A session. I wish you all a great and very interesting webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we have a very uh, packed agenda today. So um, I would like to uh, go straight into the agenda and uh, let me introduce our first speaker for today, uh, Michela Pagano. Michela has been a member of UNESCO headquarters unit for technology and AI in education since 2016, um, actively contributing to AI initiatives and implementing ICT projects across UNESCO offices in Nairobi, Paris, and Buenos Aires. Her passion centers on harnessing technology to empower education and drive positive change, with a particular emphasis on enhancing teachers' digital skills, facilitating the creation of digital teaching materials, and open education resources. 
as well as shaping ICT policies for education. Michaela, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can see my slide in uh, slide mode. Yes. Yes, we can see your slides. Yes. Thank you. So thank you and good morning. Um, good morning from uh, from Paris, from UNESCO headquarters. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of uh, presenting the guidance on generative AI and our current work on the AI competency framework for teachers. Uh, before we delve into those, um, I would like to highlight how our work in AI and education is anchored in the longstanding support in digital learning that we have been providing for years um, to our members states in an effort um, to ensure that uh, uh, the integration of technology in education adopts a human-centered approach and not a technology-first uh, uh, approach. Um, we do provide uh, technical assistance to the member states uh, through uh, provision of, uh, of policy advice, capacity development, as well as uh, our work on uh, normative um, instruments, such as the um, recommendation on open educational resources. Um, our work in AI and education specifically has as a guiding light the recommendation on the ethics uh, for artificial intelligence that was released in 2021 and adopted by its uh, the, by UNESCO's uh, 193 uh, member states. The recommendation is not only about education, it spans various policy domains and embodies a human rights based approach to AI. And among its core principles are those of proportionality, do not harm, responsibility, transparency, transparency and human oversight. So this is to give you a little bit of background to clarify um, against which context um, the, our work in AI and education further develops. Um, we have been involved in this area well before the hype um, generated by uh, ChatGPT and generative AI at the end of 2022. And again, we've been uh, um, facilitating the development of the Beijing Consensus on AI and Education. We've been developing um, AI and education guidances for policymakers. And then we've also uh, leveraged the convening power of UNESCO to, um, to, 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 to convene discussions um, around, uh, our, around this, uh, this very important uh, uh, new area. Um, but um, in... Uh, the past year, the world has been taken by storm by the novelty of um, artificial, of a generative artificial intelligence, or better, by the public release of uh, some uh, generative AI models such as uh, uh, ChatGPT. Um, how is it different from technology, from digital um, learning uh, uh, tools and um, and AI uh, and AI in the past, basically. Um, the uh, generative AI um, automated out to output generation across all symbolic uh, representations of human thinking. So going from natural language processing to production of images, sound, uh, music, uh, software code. And it really um, enables the, the delivery of finished or semi-finished um, knowledge products. It frees humans or it promises to free humans from some categories of lower order tax, tasks. But also um, it challenges us in that it can perform even better than humans some, some tasks that are traditionally associated with uh, um, higher order um, thinking skills. And um, um, and then there's there's another very important issue that I would like to mention is that um, certain generative AI um, tools such as ChatGPT really mimic um, human interaction. So it becomes very difficult to distinguish um, between talking to a machine and uh, and talking to a human. I don't know how many of you, like me, like I personally do, find themselves uh, saying please and thank you uh, while giving prompts to judge GPT in a way like sort of like um, humanizing uh, the machine. So um, 
while in the past there has been much talk about the use of AI in education, and, and I was, as I was showing before, we've been working in this area for many years, it's really with the emergence of ChatGPT and generative AI models that we clearly saw a need a pressing need for guidance from policymakers, uh, teachers, education institutions, etc. In specifically in the field of ed evaluation and assessment, we have been able to see how ChatGPT could produce well-written essays or succeed or completing some standardized testing and. That again um, has um, generated the need for a, for a specific guidance. Um, the guidance recommends um, a human centered um, approach to AI. Um, what, what, what is that? It's an approach whereby the use of AI enhances and augments human agency and human capabilities, as opposed to an approach that, that replaces or render obsolete uh, human thinking, um, decision-making and, uh, and uh, accountability. And uh, beyond the, the, um, the human agency, um, UNESCO also advocates for a, new, a use of AI in education that upholds the core humanistic values that UNESCO advocates for, that are inclusion, equity, gender equality, linguistic and cultural diversities, and plural opinions and, and expressions. Um, you can see here uh, the contents of the guidance. It looks at what generative AI is, what are the models beyond the most uh, um, well-known uh, um, tools. And then it also identifies uh, some key controversies and challenges and, and brings forward proposals for policy making and, uh, and regulations. Um, I would like to just like touch very briefly on a couple of the of the of the challenges. Um, so one of the key challenges is that for these complex uh, artificial neural networks, um, the results um, that are given out by these models may not be transparent or explainable. So while it it because it's not possible to trace back to how the outputs were determined, such as in rule based uh, models, for instance, this has implications on the trust that we can place on the results. So in a way, we may implicitly trust that these AI are right in taking such decisions, maybe because we have an inherent trust in technology, but um, that is something that is very dangerous because it takes away our human agency, our accountability and responsibility. So it is very important to, uh, in turn, know how this model uh, functions and that uh, at the end of the day, we're speaking with 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 machines that were in turn uh, sort of like set up and fed of, of, with data by 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 humans. And um, um, for this this uh, issue of like the human agency, accountability, and responsibility, I think it's particularly important in the field of evaluation and assessment, because human facilitators should always be able to explain why a certain decision was taken, and that's true, for instance, in the case of high stakes examinations, when the decisions taken by AI could have very important real life consequences. I would also like to touch briefly on the issue of data. Uh, we know that uh, generative AI tools are built on immense quantities of data and computing powers, and those are concentrated in the hands of a few companies and countries, mostly in the US, China, and to a lesser extent, Europe. And so this causes the fact that because these models are trained on existing data in a handful of countries, they necessarily reflect those values and norms. So they're not necessarily represented representative of the end users from other parts of the wars that basically did not contribute uh, to the to the building of uh, those models. Um, and then another challenge related to data is that we don't have uh, specifics on where the data comes from, especially in closed models, and if it has been obtained in violation of intellectual property rights or without consent. So um, briefly, the, uh, the, um, the guidance uh, um, advocates for uh, um, further regulations. 
um, in of uh, of generative AI in education from a more basic level of uh, adopting and endorsing general data protection law, all the way to um, developing national strategies and specific regulations on generative AI, as well as providing um, uh, capacities for proper use of generative AI in education. Um, um, then I think we're, and then it also proposes a policy framework in educational research um, according to the principles of the human-centered uh, um, approach that I was mentioning before. Um, it also um, calls in terms of regulation um, it, it calls for um, implementing a minim minimum age restriction for the independent use of generative AI in education um, settings. And I think that is particularly important in a conversation related to um, assessment and personalized uh, learning, which is also connected to a second important point that is that the use of generative AI and the challenges and the safeguards that should be adopted really depend on the education level that we're talking about. So what is it applicable at primary or secondary level may not be necessarily appropriate for uh, um, higher education or vice versa. And then um, the guidance also calls for a reflection and public debate on the long-term implications of generative AI for education and research. We don't have the answers right now, but we have to think about like what is the foundational knowledge and skills that our learners need to acquire? What are the higher order thinking skills that are needed to harness AI and generative AI outputs? And what are the vocational skills needed to work for and with generative AI? I'll just take one more minute uh, to say that uh, UNESCO is also in the process of developing AI competency frameworks for students and teachers. There are two different competency frameworks. They're still in draft forms. Um, there is an international expert group. One of the speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Kisan Song, in this distinguished panel is part of this, uh, um, of this uh, expert group. And uh, they are working on uh, drafting these uh, competency frameworks. And at the moment, uh, um, we have uh, two drafts that are up for comments. I'll share later and the link um, in which you can see the draft of these frameworks and you can also uh, access, access um, the version where you can put your comments. At the moment, um, there is a lot of discussion around, so the competency frameworks are developed um, on a two-dimensional uh, matrix with uh, three progression levels and different aspects. Um, there is a lot of discussion on what these progression levels should look like. Um, at the moment, there is this progression with uh, understand, apply, and create. But there is again a lot of um, a lot of discussions on whether like an adaptation of the Bloom's taxonomy should be adopted, or maybe uh, instead like a more like a computer science uh, um, categorization um, should uh, should be applied. And then there are different aspects for uh, students and teachers. Human centered mindset and ethics of AI are common to the two. And then, as you can see uh, here, like the students have AI foundations, AI skills, and <clears throat> AI for problem solving, while teachers have foundation AI knowledge, AI skills, AI pedagogy, and professional development. Um, so this is what the competency frameworks look like right now. This is the one for students. And then I'll go into the one for teachers. As I was saying, these are still in draft form. form. Uh, they will be released uh, at the next uh, edition of the Digital Learning Week. And uh, you can see here the call for comments. I will also put it in the chat later. Um, but we really invite uh, um, stakeholders from various areas of the world to 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 provide their comments. So this is it. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michaela, for your presentation. Um, and um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ben Leon. So let me introduce him as well. So for most of his career, Dr. Leon uh, has been teaching programming methodology and uh, advanced software engineering to undergraduate students. And over the years, he was recognized for excellent teaching with a number of uh, teaching awards, 
including the NUS Outstanding Educator Award in 2015. Uh, from uh, 2014 to 2019, Dr. Leong served as the director of the Experimental Systems and Technology Laboratory at the Ministry of Education in Singapore. Um, and in this role, Dr. Leong set up um, an internal software engineering team for MOE and oversaw the development and deployment of the MOE uh, student learning space, SLS. Uh, in 2020, Dr. Leong was appointed uh, chief data officer of AI uh, Singapore, the national AI program. And he is currently the director of the AI Center for Educational Technologies, where his team applies AI to build software platforms for education. Dr. Leong, over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, thank you, Victoria, for a very generous uh, introduction. I'm so sorry I sent you a bio, but I expect you to read the whole thing, right? Uh, so I I'm very delighted today. Thank you very much uh, for being here uh, to be able to meet with so many friends from all over the world. So uh, thank you, Victoria, for the introduction. So I'm Dan Leong. Uh, I'm currently uh, speaking from Singapore. Uh, and, and today, uh, I will try to use this time I have to share with you a little bit about what we do in Singapore at AICET, or the AI Center for Educational Technologies here in Singapore. Right, so uh, as uh, it was mentioned, okay, sorry, my slides are, okay. Uh, basically, we had, we all saw this COVID happening like just a couple of years ago. And I, I think uh, the whole world was kind of trying to figure out how to react to that, right? So in, in Singapore, what we decided was to, you know, instead of worrying about the future, uh, about, about what about just handling the, the present, we worried about the future and asked ourselves uh, how we can make this uh, kind of a crisis an opportunity, right? And what we decided to do was to invest in education. Uh, this was particularly important because COVID caused uh, many of us to kind of like uh, have a kind of a lockdown and, and, the, and the students uh, and the kids stopped going to school for a couple of uh, months. So, you know. In Singapore, I think we, we kind of had a break from school for about a month and we had teaching online for a month in our school system. Uh, within the among the universities, actually, we were kind of teaching online for about two years. So uh, here in Singapore, as uh, and, and I, I think John Jun Hua later will, will say this, is, uh, is that we believe that the teacher is really the heart of improving education. So we don't believe that technology uh, should be used for teaching for technology's sake, right? Uh, instead, what we do believe is that what we should do is to figure out how to use technology to help teachers teach better, right? And, and our key insight in, in all that we do is that uh, innovation in education, right? It is not a technology problem, okay? This is actually strange coming from me because I'm fundamentally a, a, you know, a, a tech person uh, and I basically write software and I teach my students to write software. But I believe, and I think we generally believe that uh, this innovation education with technology is really a pedagogy problem. So if we are able to figure out how we can teach better, then we can figure out how to build a software to help teachers do their job better, right? So, so in, in AICT, what we do is to adopt what we call a pedagogy first approach in deploying technology, right? So that means that uh, instead of worrying about uh, technology, we worry about what we need to do. Okay, so there are three key things that uh, my center does uh, over the, has been doing over the last uh, couple of years. Okay, first is that, uh, we are set up also to support the Singapore Ministry of Education uh, in the deployment of AI platforms. So at some level, we have a certain uh, consulting kind of a job that we do with the government, right? Uh, within our center, we have uh, the capability to build uh, software platforms, okay? And given COVID, right, the focus that we have today is on this online web platforms, okay? And, and finally, we want to figure out how we can support education innovation supported by technology. So the idea here is that uh, teachers figure out how best to teach, what they want to do differently, and then we figure out how to deploy software to support them. Okay, uh, and right now, this our center is, is uh, currently supported by funding of about 10 million Singapore dollars, which is about 7 US uh, million dollars uh, over the about five years period. Right now, we're about halfway through this uh, period. Okay, so so uh, one of the things we did uh, is, uh, is to support what's called the National AI uh, project whereby we did this proof of concept adaptive learning system. Uh, I know all of you are really excited to, to, to learn about this, but actually I'm not going to talk about it because 
right after me, uh, Jun Pat will be giving you a 15-minute uh, kind of a talk about this system, right? So today, what I'll do is I'll just I'll give you a, a quick a kind of a flavor of what we are doing here at the AI Center, and uh, later on, I can take questions during the panel. Okay, so the question is, how can we improve our teaching, right? Okay, so, so our approach is the following, right? We try to work with teachers and educators to go uh, figure out what are the pain points or the pressing problems that they are facing today uh, in the teaching. And I, I really like what uh, Margaret mentioned when, he, when she opened the session, which is that uh, the application AI is not just about trying to you know, teach, the, you know, figure out how to apply AI to, to learning itself, but actually we also figure out how we can use AI to help teachers kind of like make the, the really painful uh, kind of like jobs that they need to do and main jobs go away so that they can spend more time uh, doing what matters, right? And then after we figure out what the problem is, we build software to solve the problem. And finally, uh, we validate the, the software that we build with users and iterate until we solve the problem well. So, so today, uh, let me just give you an example of two projects that we've done so far. Okay, let's take a look at this. Let's hope this works. Are you an educator? If you are, then this one here is for you. It's grading season again which means staying late to mark scripts just to get the scores out to students on time. Best case situation? You take home the scripts and mark on your own time, but not without having to carry those huge stacks of papers back with you. Other times, you're confined to marking your scripts within a corner of the staff room, unable to knock off until your marking is completed. But what if I told you that it doesn't have to be this way? Introducing Softmark, your dependable companion for marking scripts. Softmark uses the power of modern technology to streamline the assignment grading process for teachers. With Softmark, you'll never have to worry about the pains of transporting scripts and limited marking concurrency. Simply upload the papers to our system and have access to it at home or on the go. Softmark allows for easy distribution of marking workload for concurrent marking, improving the turnover of marking homework and exams quickly. Our system is capable of handling both multiple choice questions and open-ended questions efficiently and effectively. After setting up the MCQ questions, marking just takes a click of a button, literally. For open-ended questions, our system goes beyond manual marking and ensures standardized grading across students by allowing rubric-based marking. No need to rewrite the same comments for every student. Simply drag and drop or check off the rubrics onto the paper. Yes, it's really that easy. Softmark also helps with auto-tabulation of scores for each question for each and every student. No need to ever worry about miscalculating final scores again. When you are done marking, double checking your scripts is easy with our preview feature. If you need to save the marked paper somewhere for safekeeping, simply download them with a click of a button. Of course, we also provide the feature to email the marked scripts to your students. All done! Students just have to log into the Softmark account to view their Mark script. There, they can even add comments for further learning and clarification from the teacher directly. What we have shared here with you is just the tip of the iceberg, and we have so many other features for you to explore as well. At Softmark, we believe that educators should spend less time administrating more time educating. We believe in empowering educators so that they can empower those under their charge. Are you an educator? We hope to empower you too. All right, I hope uh, all you enjoyed the short clip. Okay, let me show you the total picture. Okay, so in case you're wondering if I'm a real guy, I'm a real person, yes, this is me. Uh, and this happens to be uh, during the COVID period whereby I had to go and you will take a vaccination jab, right? So after you take a jab, you're made to sit uh, in, in this room for half an hour to make sure that you're okay. Uh, so what you see here is that it's me uh, actually grading my a real exam script, right? Uh, after vaccination. So as I'm waiting there, I am grading the, the exams, right? So, so it turns out that 
this is really quite important. Uh, it's a job that we all do as teachers, right? And uh, given that the software, I mean, CS is very popular these days, right? I have about, we have about 900 students, okay? And my classes are about 600 students, 500 students. So the, the weight of the scripts is about 40 kilograms. So not having to carry around for, uh, you know, 40 kilograms of scripts and be able to, you know, grade uh, exams, you know, even while waiting for a vaccination, uh, it is really helpful. So this one thing we did uh, over the last two years. Okay. Okay. Another, another ma major problem we have is that it's, it's been said uh, that uh, 100 million students are, are learning programming. All right. And unfortunately, uh, okay, there, there have been some uh, accounts that in some schools, okay, not 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 in US, not my school, uh, the failure rates can reach as most as high as thirty percent, right? And, and the number one reason is that it's a shortage of teachers, okay. And this is apparently a picture, uh, of, of students waiting for for the TAs. Uh. So there is a big shortage. Uh, there's a real problem of students need to learn programming, and there is uh, a problem of not having enough teachers to give them feedback when they make mistakes, right? So it turns out that at, at NUS, uh, where I'm teaching in Singapore, it's okay. Uh, what we do is we throw, we throw people at, at the problem. We have a lot, we hire a whole army of TAs who will give feedback. But frankly, this is a very expensive, very people-centric problem. So uh, with that, we have the following uh, project. It is almost midnight, and our student is writing a Python program for his assignment. It is five minutes before the submission deadline, and he has written a program. But upon running his program, he realizes that it is incorrect. He has no idea where the mistake is, and he cannot reach his teacher at this time. Enter Codavery. Our patent pending, AI driven programming coach. He just clicks the hint buttons. Behind the scenes, Codavery examines his code, and then provides personalized guidance, immediately. And this happens, within his familiar programming platform. He gets hints, and not answers. This way, he fixes his mistakes, while at the same time, learning the programming concepts. Our technology also reduces the teacher's load, by highlighting common student misconceptions, helping grade submissions, and curating student-specific problems. Codavery's technology helps students learn, and teachers do what they do best. Okay, so I, I hope you like that as well. Uh, okay, so I, I think you heard the, the same theme repeated many times. What we're going to do is actually to help reduce the teacher's load, right? So that they can have more time to teach better. Uh, so, I, okay, those are the two projects that are more or less uh, quite mature, okay? But what's happening right now is, is that we're also working on this adaptive chatbot for teaching. So there have been, uh, obviously, you know about ChatGPT, but we don't think that a chatbot where the student actually asks a, a, a robot, uh, a kind of chatbot is the right way to go. Uh, instead, we, instead uh, like what uh, Michaela says, that some of these chatbots are human-like, right? So when you use that kind of human-like interface, right, to be able to have, uh, some, have teachers outsource sort of teaching and monitoring of students uh, to, to AI, okay? And then with the chat GPT, frankly, uh, plagiarism has become a real paid problem. Uh, so one of the things we're looking into is how we can do plagiarism checking better okay, in the area of chat GPT. This is also uh, something we're looking at, uh, at at this point, okay? So given chat GPT and, and the rise of these large language models, okay, uh, I think what we're trying to do is to harness uh, the so-called human-like behavior of, uh, of the latest generative AI algorithms, right, to see how we can create a uh, kind of interface with students that is more uh, personable and more human-like. Okay, so, so this is sort of my uh, semi-last slide, almost at the end. So we believe that uh, teaching, uh, the heart of good teaching is really in the business of managing motivation, right? So what we're going to do in, in AMI Center is to build tools that help teachers to connect with more students and to teach more effectively online, right? So that hopefully uh, we can improve, uh, increase the reach of good teachers so that many more people uh, hopefully, uh, maybe even across geographical boundaries. In fact, uh, I, I see some Myanmarese friends. In fact, I'm actually uh, doing a pilot project to actually teach some students in Myanmar as we speak. Okay, so let me just recap what we do at our center. We identify real problems and opportunities uh, for teaching. We build AI-based software, okay, and then we iterate with real users. Okay, uh, and hopefully, you know, if we work hard enough, uh, we'll become, eventually become like the Xerox Park in education here in sunny Singapore. So on, on that note, uh, yeah, and then we are focused on helping teachers. Okay, on that note, I, I thank you for your time and I'll hand this time back to Victoria. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much, Dr. Leong, for the presentation. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Su. 
He is a senior specialist within the Educational Technology Division of the Ministry of Education in Singapore. Uh, with a portfolio that spans various facets of educational technology, Mr. Su has played a pivotal role in advancing artificial intelligence in education. His expertise extends to pioneering AI projects uh, tailored for teaching and learning with a particular focus on adaptive learning system. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Victoria. I hope you can see this slide. Yes, we can see your presentation well. Thank you, thank you. Right, thank you. So this session will focus on the ALS or the Adaptive Learning System TOC that uh, Dr. Ben Leong has mentioned earlier. So maybe some background. The ALS is one of the MOE's three education AI use cases announced under the National AI Strategy launched in November 2019, together with the Learning Feedback Assistance and the Learning Companion. The ALS aims to help teachers better customize and improve students' learning experiences. The adaptive learning system provides a personalized learning pathway for each student, recommends learning resources, practice questions, and customized feedback based on his or her progress and readiness. These recommendations are based on the student's cognitive and effective state, built upon sound pedagogical and curriculum models, and enhanced over time. All the three AI systems will be delivered through the Singapore Student Learning Space or the SLS. The design of the ALS is based upon two main classes the learning experience and the learning effectiveness. In learning experience, the intent was to ensure learner readiness and encourages independent learning. In this, it considers the learner's needs beyond ac academic performance so that they may build a positive relationship with learning. For learning effectiveness, it is to build a reliable learner profile and to understand effectiveness of content. Here, high quality data collection is needed to build students' profiles so that AI can enhance their learning experience. I'll go a little deeper into both classes. There are four design principles guiding the ALS learning experience. Firstly, to empower learners to make learning decisions in their, in their learning. So the system, the system is designed where students have choice in how they learn and what they learn. Secondly, to ensure learners feel safe and are free from pressure that holds them back from trying. The, system learning, the system's learning artifacts in terms of the mistakes that they made and how many attempts that they took are private to the students in the SLS. They have, they have the option to share their learning artifacts with the teachers for feedback and guidance. Thirdly, to enable learners with adequate support and opportunities to build resilience and self-efficacy, the system will recommend a guiding, guided learning mode with teachers picking resources and scaffolding contents if its assessment of the student is one that requires support. If it detects a strong student, the recommendation could be one of a challenge mode where there is a check of the mastery without additional support. Lastly, the system is designed to be contextual and personalized so that the trust could be built between learner and the system, and in doing so, students are open to receive guidance and recommendations. So I'll quickly walk through uh, the user flow in the ALS. So first, students are onboarded and profiled. So first, students enter the system through the SRS, right? And they are onboarded and profiled in the welcome loop. Uh, they'll be asked questions, uh, and they'll be taking charge of their own learning by setting targets for the week, the learning targets for the week. But if this is not the first time entering this week, they'll be directed to a dashboard where the AI has already shortlisted the concepts that they are ready to learn. Here, the students will have a choice of what topic they want to learn. From the dashboard, they will be recommended one of the three learning modes. Again, students have an option to override the recommendation with their own choice. In our system, there are three learning modes. And guided learning mode is a mode here. Students are provided learning contents such as videos and animations before they are assessed. 
In the challenge mode, students will not receive any guidance as it's focused on assessing the student's mastery of the concept. Based on their abilities and dispositions, the AI, AI recommends students to move between the modes as required. And we have a third learning mode, which is the revision mode. Here, students will be brought through a mix of previously learned concepts to reinforce their learning, and the AI constantly updates their mastery levels and prompts them to revise when it's deemed that mastery for a certain concept may have weakened due to the effect of the processing curve. The next task is the learning effectiveness. So this is about the building a reliable learner profile and understand content effectiveness through three main models. The curriculum model, the learner model, and the content model. Curriculum model is a representation of the curriculum. Our curriculum planning specialists uh, from our curriculum uh, branches drew up the curriculum hierarchy and prerequisite network so that the AI can recommend a sound learning path to help students attain mastery. Through machine learning, the system will identify the strengths and weaknesses of each node so that the planners can reassess their initial work network. The learner model is the representation of the learner mastery in the process. This includes students' ability, modeling, and performance prediction. The content model is a representation of content structures and its metadata. The content usage and assessment metrics will help our content developers better understand the efficacy of their resources and make necessary tweaks to their content development. The three models together help to build a reliable learner profile so that the system can make accurate recommendations. Decision making and recommendation is supported by both AI engine and the defined rule base on pedagogical models and adaptation models. Pedago pedagogical model is a representation of the tutoring strategies and action. The ARS is designed with the attack pedagogical scaffolds as a main tutoring strategy. This is the same strategy that is employed by all Singaporean teachers as it considers the use of attack for teaching and learning. This defines the learning experiences and learning path. The adaptation model is a representation of the preference statements in the system. These are used in recommendation of learning concepts and modes. Taken together, the models make the necessary decisions and recommendations to ensure the students get learning recommendations that are personalized to their abilities. At the same time, the teachers are provided with them information that will help them make interventions where necessary to help students to help support the students. The next segment we will take a quick look at the implementation and a summary of the evaluation. The proof on concept was piloted last year with six primary schools primary schools to ensure both engine and performance and learning needs were met. The evaluation covers seven aspects self-directed learning, self-efficacy, teachers' receptiveness, learning gain, system performance, learning path, curriculum and content. So here are some of the key findings. So for the positive aspect, what we went what we went well, right? Students who use the ALS for learning showed slightly higher learning gain than those who did not. So externally measured learning gains show that there is a very small positive effect. Uh, further, further analysis across schools and across pre-ability scores shows a very small effect with high variation. For the teachers, they found that the, there's adequate information on the learning progress dashboard for intervention at the individual level for the students. And in terms of the system, the performance and content adequacy were acceptable. In fact, the AUC for all the pilot students reached a threshold of about 0 0.75. Uh, this is computed with a data of 650 students and a total of uh, 103,706 questions over a month period. So there are some areas that we don't do so well. So for example, in terms of students, we found that amongst the three, road, three learning modes, there were lower completion rates for guided and revision mode as compared to the challenge mode. So this is something that we have taken aboard and are doing a refinement for the next iteration of the system. For the teachers, 
They found that it's effortful to translate the ALS findings into a classroom level intervention. So we will also be looking at how we could aggregate uh, the data better so that to help teachers uh, make better sense of the learning data. And finally, the estimation of students' ability using the ARS has moderate co correlation with a well calibrated system such as the Catalyst. So, this is my sharing. So thank you very much. We can take some questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Su. And uh, I would like to invite also everybody who is uh, in this webinar to um, drop the questions. I'm sure after um, this few presentations, you already have quite a few questions. So please drop them in, a, in our Q&A box and um, we will have a discussion, a uh, more interactive time uh, towards the end of our presentations. So, and now let me introduce our final speaker, uh, Mr. K uh, Ki Sang Song. So, Mr. Song is a, an international expert of ICT in education, and um, he was the principal investigator of the development of global ICT in education indicators uh, for education development project. Uh, he holds a PhD from the University of Washington, and his research concentrates on the areas of ICT application in education and learning sciences. Uh, he has published more than 150 articles and presentations and around 90 papers focusing on AI application in, in education, uh, intelligent tutoring systems, multimedia and computer applications for education, and ICT in education for developing countries. Mr. Song, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victoria. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce the advanced the technology applications in the teaching and uh, learning process to the UNESCO Knowledge Sharing Program. Um, today, I want to uh, introduce the uh, ICT applications to the teaching and learning process, starting with why um, technology in education. Um, and the, the uh, organizers of the webinar asked me to prepare a presentation considering the uh, Korean cases of uh, eye tracking system or the AI tutoring um, integrated uh, digital textbooks and uh, intelligent tutoring system for coding lessons and uh, the uh, plan to integrate the generative AI uh, to learning in Korea and so many, I mean, uh, topics, but um, I will uh, briefly introduce uh, some of them and then I will conclude uh, the um, assessment issues in technology-based uh, learning systems. Okay. Um, the typical teaching and learning process can be modeled as this diagram. Um, typically, any instructor who present any information to the learners, then um, he or she gives questions to check uh, whether the learner understand the instructions. And then he will give some um, feedback to the learner. From this model, um, the two uh, previous presenters, they are uh, um, presented that how we can apply the technologies to model. Uh, this kind of uh, teaching and learning process into a computerized system. And there is a very interesting paper published by the uh, Bloom um, that uh, the uh, um, every student who takes a tutoring class, a one on one tutoring class, uh, improves as much as the top 2% of students who take. Uh, classroom instructions uh, in the size of uh, 20 or 30 group lesson settings. What does it mean? <clears throat> uh, from this figure, actually, uh, anyone who are in the middle uh, of the 20 or 30 um, um, classroom size, but if uh, the student receives the one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring lessons, then his uh, uh, achievement will be improved as the top 2% of the group settings. And then that means that the one-on-one -on -one tutoring is very powerful, but the problem is that why Bloom um, titled his paper as a two-sigma problem? 
um, because he um, titled this paper because of knowing the effectiveness of one-on-one -on -one tutoring, but uh, it is not easy to provide such learning circumstances in any society. Then how we can solve the problem? Um, one of the results, the effort to find the solutions of such problem is technology integrating into education. We call that is edtech. And there are two approaches that we can apply ICT in education. One is a computer as a tool. The other one is a computer as a tutor. Um, <clears throat> for the computer as a tool approach, we use many technologies that appeared in the market. Look at here. We have long history of um, technology that appeared in the market, and we wanted to um, apply these technologies into um, our teaching and learning process. And uh, from the CAI and the, to the intelligent tutoring systems, now actually the ITS is uh, integrated with AI, but uh, the integrating um, integrate intelligent tutoring system, actually it is a kind of a computer as a tutor approach so um, now actually we are pacing the AI in education that is implementing the intelligent tutoring systems with AI and big data. Okay, um, now uh, let me introduce uh, briefly about how we can use the eye tracking. Um, nowadays we experience a lot of uh, smart devices that can measure um, um, the human behaviors like uh, using EEG, eye, eye tracking, or ECG, or fMRI, or even webcam. We if using the webcam, we can um observing the learner's attitude uh, or behaviors in the class. So we can we can evaluate their um situations. So um so this actually uh, may help to teachers to give. Uh, uh, immediate feedbacks. Okay, so one of the technologies that the eye tracking and uh, <clears throat> eye tracking is a kind of uh, physiological systems that measures the human eye movement to uh, diagnosis the, the student um, focusing point. Okay, so in this slide, actually, I um, implemented the eye tracking to measure the multitasking behaviors. Um, this is a learning, um, e-learning uh, window. So we provide the content and then during this uh, e-learning task, we also uh, um, open some um, windows like music playrooms or uh, web browsers. And then students you know, distracted their attention. Um, from the uh, main task to the uh, disturbances. So we can measure um, how the students um, distract from this kind of uh, um, activities. Also, we uh, uh, use the eye tracking to check uh, the eye movement of learners. For example, um, in scratch programming, um, how the student pay attention to the execution window or a uh, programming window or block coding window. So we can um, diagnose the student understanding of the uh, platforms. So here actually the, we can compare the learner and A and B's uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, for example, learner A spent uh, more time on the programming, but uh, learner B spend uh, less time on, or he spend more time on execution. That means that the comparing between learner A and B, we can say that learner B is uh, uh, more uh, prepared to use Scratch and is skillful in solving problems with the uh, um, block coding programming environment. All right, now um, I want to talk about the Korean approaches to develop AI-based digital textbooks. Actually, the Korea has uh, tried to develop the digital textbook since uh, 2007, 
but it was not quite so successful with the various reasons. But the Ministry of Education, they uh, announced that they will deploy AI-based data textbooks by 2025. And uh, uh, they are targeting uh, first to uh, third uh, and fourth and seventh grade and the 10th grade students and the class subject are uh, math, English and informatics educations and with uh, taking several artificial technologies such as uh, intelligent tutoring system and the extended uh, virtual world such as metaverse and expanded uh, uh, reality and the conversational artificial intelligence and the speech recognition based on the categories books uh, of the textbooks okay now um I want to uh, introduce the AI application in coding education for elementary students. Actually, most countries are trying to um, teach the coding as early as possible in schools. However, have you thought about what may happen in a coding classroom with 20 or more students? This woman actually uh, um, squat down behind the student big screen observing the student programming progress. If you have the experience of teaching coding or programming, you may know the difficulties to uh, understand or comprehending another person's code uh, in real time. It is not easy. So to help teachers in coding class, we have developed to grasp the student coding progress in real time with AI technique. And this slide shows um, when a student code, the, uh, his or her code is transfer transferred to the server and their progress is analyzed by the server and reported to the teacher's screen. Then the teacher monitors um, each student progress and can provide the timely feedback who are in need. Okay, so actually um, the formative assessment is very important because the teachers can provide the immediate feedback to the student, but um, until now it is not easy to provide this kind of feedback to the student, but when we apply the AI techniques uh, in this kind of uh, uh, teaching system, we can provide such real-time uh, progress information to the instructor. This is uh, some snapshots of our developed systems. The left one actually shows the real progress of the student in numbers. And the upper um, right slide uh, figure shows that some recommendations how when um, student coding, if they do not know which code block, code block should be used, then um, our system recommend some blocks that they may choose. And this one is that the real time, um, their achievement um, progress as a diagram. So using this diagram, the, uh, the teacher uh, can find who need the help and then can give immediate feedback. All right now, um, I want to uh, talk about the uh, adopting generative AI in learning in Korea. Uh, recently, a report has been published that the higher education um, trying to adopt the ChatGPT in uh, a student learning. Actually, this slide shows that which subjects are mostly uh, used in, in the uh, <clears throat> ChatGPT application. That's actually the coding and programming subject and essay and writing summary and the brainstorming and developing ideas. So actually when um, students need some coding or programming um, subject, they are using uh, the ChatGPT mostly. And then uh, they check that whether um, students feel that um, they think their learning effectiveness has been improved using generative AI. And then most of them, yes, um, answer yes. Uh, more than 85%, they yeah, the answer yeah. That means that generative AI is very useful for higher student. And then um, uh, the hallucination of the ChatGPT is always problem. So um, they check whether 
um, they um, check the chat GPT's responses and then the student answer that some part they uh, want to use, they check the correctness and uh, only check the, the suspicious parts. Okay, and uh, some student, they check all the responses from the chat GPT. That means that uh, in higher education, the hallucination problem is not a uh, quite big problem because they always checking the correctness of the uh, answers. All right, um, to conclude my talk, I want to raise the assessment issues in technology-based learning system. As we apply computers or technology in education, it implies that assessment with data taken by computer or systems. So this actually provides some um, stealth assessment because uh, when we measure the student knowledge or skills and other attributes with invisible data, uh, we can acquire that kind of data from uh, intelligent tutoring systems or some uh, systems that we are taking the data while the students are solving problems. But when we apply AI in tech education, it may differ the stairs assessment. And I think we need to uh, notify students in advance because uh, some ethical issues may have uh, maybe happen uh, through this kind of stairs assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Song. Um, and now, before we proceed to the next part of our program, uh, let me introduce our moderator for the panel discussion, Benjamin. Benjamin is a program specialist at UNESCO Bangkok. He works in the areas of digital transformation in TVET and higher education. Benjamin, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Victoria. For this Q&A, our priority is to take as many questions as, as possible from the audience. So we encourage you to, uh, to type your questions in the chat box or your question and answer uh, format. However, if there are not uh, enough questions, I have some playful questions to our speakers. So, well, I'd like to start with Michaela. Michaela, what is yeah. UNESCO's clear message to governments regarding the use of AI in education? Um, I think the clear message is that um, the educational needs and the pedagogical needs need to come first. Um, there needs to be a human-centered um, approach to the use of AI in education and not a technology-first um, approach. We cannot expect AI to transform education just because we have an inherent trust in technology and on this uh, techno solutionism approach. So um, AI needs to respond to the needs um, of education. It needs to be controllable, human accountable. It needs to be transparent and it can be uh, turned off if needed. And finally the principle of proportionality like in a world where we know quite well what are the main challenges in education and specifically in some parts of the wards where there are challenges that are still related to like teacher availability connectivity electricity and so on and so forth we really need to assess very carefully whether ai and technology first approaches are the way to go, as opposed to other solutions. Over. Thank you, Michaela. To Dr. Ben Leong, I'd like to ask more about your experience in deploying the AI platform in Singapore MOE. Uh, I have a three-part question. Uh, yeah. The first is, what part of the work that you thought it was difficult, but it turned out to be easy? Uh, the second part is what was the most challenging part of the job uh, that you found in the entire process? And the third question is what should developing countries be thinking or doing right now so that they can develop a similar platform within five years? Wow. Uh, okay. Thank you very much uh, for that means for the questions. Uh, so 
So before I, I, I start, let me just say that I would like to invite Jun Huat uh, to jointly mm. answer this question with me because uh, honestly, Jun Huat and I uh, work, work quite closely uh, and I was uh, with MOE for five years. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm quite familiar with not just the, the current platform, but, you know, with many uh, tech platforms. Uh. So I, I think the first thing I want to say is that um, <clears throat> one of the things that we want to avoid and, and make sure we, we don't fall into the trap is to think that uh, and, and to this is actually what Michaela just said. I want just want to repeat what she said is that education should not be driven mm -hmm. by technology, right? Education needs to be driven by teachers, uh, and pa by pedagogy. And I want to say, uh, to our credit in Singapore, uh, you know, I know, I, I know, I'm certain that Jun Huat also agrees with me that, uh, mm -hmm. we are teachers first, right? Teachers are the heart of our, our education system. Okay, now, now, the, now to to answer your question more more uh, specifically. The challenge in deploying uh, technology is actually never about technology generally, right? The main problem with deploying technological solutions is actually people problems. So uh, it is actually, uh, it's, it's actually, okay, if you have the skills uh, and, and the people to do the work, technical work is actually quite easy, right? Uh, the challenge is uh, actually stakeholder management, uh, getting people to buy in and having people actually accept uh, the new ways of, of, of learning and teaching. Uh, teachers sadly are often not very receptive to new systems and new ways of, of doing things. Uh. So I, I think it's very important uh, to do a lot of work, uh, not so much uh, in the building of the, of the platforms and technologies, but in understanding the teachers who will be using the technology, ensuring that they are convinced that uh, we're not going to be generating more work for them and that it's going to be good for the teachers and, and also for the students. I, I think that's really quite important. Okay, so that, that's the most difficult part. Uh. Um, I mean, I, I've worked at MOE for five years before this latest uh, collaboration, so there's nothing, no real surprises. Uh, and uh, the, the easy part was actually, interestingly, the technology parts. Mm. Okay, uh, Junhua can, can probably uh, add to me to my part. My part was very easy, uh, but yeah, it's like, interestingly, the tech parts was really easy. Okay, I, I think Junhua is one who has the war story to tell on the people parts. Uh. Maybe I'll just add on a bit more, so to mm. echo uh, Dr. Ben's uh, uh, message about pedagogy first. I think that, that is the key, right? So in our deployment, like what Dr. Ben said, the, the technology is not really the issue, but then it's yeah. how about the approach to the teachers, the students. The key is not to add, work, add more work to the teacher and the students. The teachers and students are very busy. So how can we use the technology, right, to develop a system that will help them uh, cut down their workload, right, and then help them learn more meaningfully with the technology. That was the key uh, for us, yeah. Okay, and I think the second part to uh, Benjamin's question, which I can try, try, try to answer, which is that how should other countries actually try to replicate uh, what Singapore does? Uh? Okay, so I must first uh, caution uh, everyone here that uh, technology is actually very expensive. Okay, uh, I, 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 mean, I, I think Jun Huat mentioned this thing called the SLS, the student learning space. Uh, unfortunately, it was also my problem many years ago. Uh, it's actually a very expensive project. And uh, so the challenge here in deploying IT projects is that uh, it's just very, very expensive, uh, extremely challenging to pull off, right? Um, so so my, my sense is this. I think Singapore is uh, a little bit fortunate. I think we have a lot of resources. So, you know, there's something that we could afford to invest in. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure that uh, building such systems is actually necessarily, uh, you know, something that people want to... Uh, focus on, on in the first step. I think the more important thing is actually focusing on uh, teacher training, uh, which is actually what we do, right? So I, I think the, the what I want to caution against is really uh, too much focus on shiny things. I mean, it's a new thing. Everybody thinks the greatest thing. Uh, but fundamentally, teaching and learning is not, it's not a new thing. I mean, teaching and learning has been around for the last, you know, cent many centuries, right? And I think the fundamental limit is really the human brain, right? And uh, the, the key is the teachers. So I, I would I would uh urge everyone to proceed with caution and uh try not to I try try to see what other people have done, uh and, and uh you know follow along uh, you know instead of uh spending too much money you know it's really expensive I mean. uh even the ALS is really expensive I mean mm -hmm. uh to be honest. Okay, we will take one question from the audience. Uh, maybe what are Maybe anyone can answer from the speakers. What are the key considerations and guidelines for responsible and effective use of AI in research? Uh, what is the potential of impact of AI in research in such settings? And 
are the existing guidelines or parameters to harness AI's potential in addressing specific challenges, even if there are resource limitations and other socioeconomic factors. Uh, maybe to simplify the question is uh, how AI can be useful in uh, the research work of the teachers and students. And what should they watch out uh, for potential dangers? Actually, uh, when we are um, using the generative AI, then a uh, student may get some ideas to develop or uh, solving some solutions. And then uh, when uh, we ask them to cooperate together, and then uh, they can figure out the uh, the best uh, um, solutions from using using such platforms, I guess. Okay. Uh, Michaela, yes. you want to add something? Um, Yes, maybe just to add a couple of things that the guidance uh, indeed identifies uh, some potential uh, creative use of uh, generative AI in the field of research, uh, such as the possibility of using generative AI as an AI advisor for research outlines and uh, the use of uh, Gen AI to um, conduct uh, uh, preliminary um, literature reviews. Uh, so those are uh, some uh, possible uses, but there are risks associated with the fact um, that um, that uh, the outputs that are generated are not necessarily accurate. Um, when, for instance, when ChatGPT sometimes when it's asked to provide uh, to provide uh, uh, sources and references. If he doesn't have those sources and that reference, he makes them up. So there is uh, the issue of, uh, of the trust um, in the results that are produced. And then what I was mentioning in the presentation, there is the issue of like, where does that data come from? If the data, if those models are trained using um, data and uh, and uh, and um, and values and resources from just one part of the world and some some groups, um, then the outputs necessarily reflect um, what has been inputted um, in those models. So uh, that has a risk of you know like what is not there, what is not inputted there as data is not visible and is automatically uh, not part of the conversation. So there is that risk that it only, it's all, the, the outputs are only a photograph of what has been inputted. And if many parts of the world are excluded, that is reflected um, in the outputs. And that also applies to research because uh, it's, it doesn't take into account uh, a lot of the existing. Um, just because it's not being captured in the data. Over. Thank you, Michaela. I'd like to, there was a question about how useful does UNESCO guidance on research, AI in research and education? How is it helpful to countries like Korea and Singapore? Does it help you? Does the guidelines help you uh, further uh, in your work on developing textbooks and assessments? Or you started your work first way before UNESCO uh -huh. developed the guidelines. Actually, in Korea, um, the they are very uh, sensitive to the personal um, information protection of mm -hmm. the student because uh, their achievement level or any information is uh, can be released to other side outside. So uh, they are very sensitive about that issue, but. Uh, while you know the uh, UNESCO developed the guidelines, I mean, parallelly the uh, Korean mm -hmm. minister they try to. So now we are going together. So maybe few years later we will uh, reflect uh, that issues to to their um, product probably. Yes, thank you, and Dr. Ben and Junwat. Uh, what's the perspective from Singapore? I I think Junwat should. On health ministry, I've left the ministry for a while already, so I'm not uh sure what's the position. Mm -hmm. But I'm almost certain Singapore we have a 
policy, right? Uh, which is what on, on AI and education. Yes. Yeah, so so we have the AI ethics framework in the uh, MOU. So uh, I think it is really highly aligned to the UNESCO framework as well. So therefore, mm. uh, whatever development, whatever AI tools that we are developing, we are actually guided by uh, the framework and then we make sure that it doesn't violate any of the, 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 the considerations within the framework itself. Yeah. Mm. I want to go to the one question from the audience. Uh, they saying uh, AI can be can promote dishonesty among students, and yeah. how do you capture that in your systems, <laughs> Doc, Doctor Kisang? <laughs> it is not easy to capture the honesty, yeah. <laughs> and the plagiarism, you know, of uh, using the um, Chat GPT or generative AI is very. Um, I mean, difficult to capture. So <laughs> we have to or maybe instruct our student to be honest. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Oh, yeah, in fact, we have found that, uh, no, so I, I'm teaching now, I've been teaching for, I've been used, I've been dealing with this problem for a while. We have found uh, in Singapore that uh, number one, the students have been using a lot, right? And number two, it's mm. very, very, very hard to catch them. I mean, in, uh, so we teach programming, right? So in the past, mm. we have very, very good tools uh, for what's called plagiarism detection, uh, that has actually uh, many tools have, have not succeeded, have not worked. Uh. So we know the students are taking answers of child check GPT. Uh, we cannot prove that. So like, so one of my, one of the one of the the, the thing projects that my center is not looking into is, is precisely this, right? How do we cope with this new uh, chat GPT uh, based plagiarism? You know, how can we catch mm -hmm. them? How can we detect that? Uh, honestly, I, I would say that I I'm not entirely uh optimistic. I, I think we may have to at some point surrender and, and figure out how to teach and set homework in such a way whereby, you know, we take for granted that the students will, will kind of ask JGPT for answers. And mm -hmm. then uh, potentially we may have to have uh, better assessment frameworks uh, to actually uh, mm -hmm. test the students fairly. Mm -hmm. This is a problem we need to deal with. Yeah. Mr. Junwat, I'd like to go back to one of your slides regarding the key findings in the pilot trial evalu evaluation. Uh, one of the findings for the students is that slightly higher learner gains, uh, emphasis on slightly. And for the teachers, effortful to translate ALS findings to classroom, classroom level inter intervention, uh, emphasis on effortful. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So in our POC last year, we did a pre-test and a post-test with the students using the system and without the system. So we had a benchmarking uh, system called the Catalytic, which will do the pre- and post-test. This is a, uh, also another adaptive testing uh, platform that is developed by our assessment experts in MOE. All right. So we did a test uh, between the pre pre-test uh, in control group and experiment group. So we found that there's only a very slight uh, slight uh, effect, right? Uh, positive effect on the on, on the experiment group student. So that, that was it. Uh, so the effect size is about 0 0.2. So we uh, so we're not claiming uh, the system has done ma damn magic uh, with uh, learning gain, but we thought that the, the system provided uh, students with a, a, a different way of learning uh, the, 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 the content itself, all right? Beyond just the, the normal the textbook and teacher delivery, delivery system to the, uh, the, the classroom. Right. So then the second point is about the effortful translation of the insights from the uh, teacher's perspective. So we have we do have a, a sort of a teacher dashboard for the teachers to understand the students' um, uh, progress, learning progress using the system. So at the individual level, teachers uh, found it useful. But then uh, most of the time in the classroom, teacher wants to aggregate. Right, the intervention rather than looking at individual students because the classroom time is very limited. So therefore, from the point of perspective, uh, the 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 data is too granular. So we are looking at how we can aggregate a higher level, class level, group level kind of uh, uh information so that teachers can actually use uh the, this information for a more targeted uh, group level kind of intervention. So this is something mm -hmm. we're working on. Uh follow-up questions. Uh, from the government perspective, is it worth the effort and investment? And will this be optional or compulsory in the future? Okay, thank you for the question. I think uh, there's nothing compulsory in uh, in uh, Singapore, all right? So we are, we provide a 
a, 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 a wealth of a range of uh, mm. uh, learning opportunities for the students. So the SLS uh, is the main driver of all the systems. So the ALS is part of the SLS. All right, mm. students can use the system for self-directed learning. And actually, in the in the actual in, in the first design, all right, it is main, mainly looking at for self student self-directed learning for all levels of students. So, uh, regardless of the students, uh, you know the the levels, the the income. So this is a is a is a leveling platform. Every students will have access to good quality, uh, content that is developed in house by the ministry. And it's available for everybody. And this tutor, this intelligent, intelligent tutor, is there for all students, regardless of uh, the learning styles, the way. So if the students are willing to put time effort into learning in the system itself, they will benefit from using the system. Right. Thank you. Professor Kisang, uh, you have one slide about learning analytics. Mm -hmm. Is this the teacher's job? Or is this another person or another team's job that to, that will that is supposed to support the teachers, or is it a machine a machine's job uh, where the teachers can uh, automatically get all the data analytics? And the second part of the question is: Will there be a significant shift in the role and responsibilities of the teacher uh, in the entire teaching and learning process in the future? Yeah, actually, our system provides the uh, student code analysis result to the teachers. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain times uh, period that the automatically the student code transfer to the uh, server and the server analyze that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, teacher's role is uh, actually important because uh, our system provides the, uh, you know, 20 or 30 student achievement level. So uh, the teacher may select who will, I mean, help within the classroom. So I think when we apply this, this kind of like AI system in the classroom, still, uh, I think we have to give the important role to the teachers, not only mm -hmm. uh, depend on the system itself. So our system actually helping or assisting the teachers to effectively managing the uh, you know coding classes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think it, we don't have uh, enough time. I just have one uh, last questions to all of our speakers. If we can put a giant billboard in the middle of your city in Korea, in Singapore, in Paris. What message would you put in that giant billboard? Uh, that's for that's for the uh, all the speakers. Michaela. So maybe I would want to reiterate that uh, that learning and education are social, and uh, the human element of learning and the social interaction element of um, of education and schooling is very important. Um, we should not just focus on the learning outcomes, but on the holistic development of the person. And so we should really not lose sight of that, especially when we talk about technology, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. Learning is social. Over. Thank you, Michaela. Professor Kisa? Uh -huh. To me, I think uh, when we apply the uh, AI technologies into our um, teaching and learning process, I think uh, the role of the uh, student will be changed more active and mm -hmm. uh, they will um, trying to solve some problems by, by them themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the role of actually the teachers uh should be changed a little bit facilitator or supporters because uh while we asking students to actively joining uh in the uh, solving process they will acquire more um knowledge or skills they need so that will change the pedagogy style in the future i, I guess thank you thank you june what what can we see in the middle of singapore <laughs> 
<laughs> maybe we can have a joint billboard with Ben, uh, Dr. Ben. Anyway, okay. so I think learning, uh, learning is an individual endeavor. All right, so the systems, the, the government, you can put in place many, many uh, different good things for the students, but ultimately, students must take the, the ownership of their own learning. I think that is the key message that we want to drive for our students in Singapore. And maybe Dr. Ben has something to add to this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ben. Thank you, thank you. So interestingly, I, I just gave a talk to teachers uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and um, I end up, okay, uh, interestingly, because of my background, right, I, I was there to talk about AI, right? But uh, interestingly, my kind of like my message, my key message to, to the teachers is this, uh, which is that ultimately we should not be distracted by technology, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I keep in mind that really uh, the business of teaching, in my view, is really the business of managing motivation. So basically, the, uh, our role as teachers, right, is, is somehow make students want to learn, right? You know, if students want to learn, then I, I think we will have succeeded somehow, right? And, and so uh, I think the, my, my message is that uh, given even though now, this, now AI is big, it's rich, I think we should not be, the teachers should not be distracted. We should remember that our fundamental core as teachers is to care for our students. And the message I will put is that teaching is about heart, right? So I think as long as we care about our, teacher, mm -hmm. our students, uh, we'll succeed with or without technology. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we end our Q&A, but I still encourage the audience to continue typing your questions and we can uh, reach out to the speakers if they can provide answers to your questions. Thank you. Over to you, Victoria. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, everyone. Okay. And uh, on behalf of UNESCO Bangkok and NECMAP, Thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, we greatly appreciate your support and we look forward to hosting more knowledge sharing uh, webinars like this one in the future. And for NECMAP members, uh, we look forward to seeing you at our NECMAP annual meeting in December. Have, have a wonderful day and um, goodbye to everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin and Victoria. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.